Hey, Taylor, great episode. You know, you make a great point how the older games are designed for characters to catch up. When you look at the experience point tables for the classes in classic Gygaxi and D&D, you'll see that it's very easy to catch up with when in one level of the party. So even at higher levels, which I know, you, you know, a lot of people don't play higher level play because, you know, they don't have the time or their, you know, group doesn't have the fortitude to stick with one game. But regardless, the if you have a higher level party, say a six level party in a Gygaxian D&D game and a character dies, they can easily get from first level to fifth level with the same experience it takes the other characters to get from sixth to seventh level. So the ability to catch up quickly is built into the game because they expect character death, because they expect the story not to revolve around one character, but to revolve around an ongoing game with a rotating cast of characters. It's funny you mentioned fortitude. That kind of struck me right in the gut. <laughs> it dawns on me, I'm in a position now where I don't get to play uh, very often. I was playing a bit last year, but the with the new baby, I'm remembering why I didn't get to start the blog for a long time. I had content that I wanted to put on the blog, but when the twins were super little, it just I just couldn't do it. And at, at the moment, we're going through that same period with the new little guy, and so it's it's just so hard to, to do anything. So I'm in a weird position now where I don't have time to play, and I'm just this desire. I want to invest that time. I want to get to that level of play. Uh, and then I'm thinking back. In college, I was playing a lot. I was playing uh, up to three times a week. And fortitude, that's that's the thing. It's We didn't have it. The, well, I would have. I would have played until the ends of the earth. But the guys I was playing with, they would get bored. We would play for six months and they would get bored. They would want to do a different character. They would want to do a different narrative arc, which a little bit that if we were playing OSR in college, that would have solved this problem with stables of PCs, with uh, non-linear sandbox type hook uh, environments, blah, blah, blah. But at the time, I just, uh, this was before the OSR had really taken off and this was before I was actually aware that people still played the old editions. I mean, I knew they were out there, but I rarely saw a book. Uh, I never ran into someone who was looking back on the old editions fondly. I guess at that at that time, I, I should I should have uh, I should have spent more time on the internet. <laughs> Find my, found my way to Knights and Knaves or something like that. But uh, anyway, the important part is they did not have the fortitude to stick it out to get to those high-level plays. They did not care. about they, they worked through the arc that they wanted to uh, see their character through, or they worked through a character arc and they were happy with it and they wanted to move on to something new. And you're, you're absolutely right, and that punched me right in the gut because I've been there. Um, I've had campaigns Twitter away because the players didn't want to be there and the, to end on a positive note that is a huge thing about um, the golden age of gaming that we're currently in because if you have players drop for reasons you can keep running the game like look at uh, Jason Hobbs and the Kalmata game I have not been in a Kalmata game in a while. I don't see myself as being able to be in a Kalmata game in a while. Uh, it went on before me. Uh, it went on with me, and it's going on without me. And that's awesome because your players, they may run into life situations. Uh, they may have uh, issues with their commitment uh, to the character or to the campaign. They may have interests change. And when you have the opportunity to play online, you can keep your campaign going, and it's awesome. The campaign can survive a change in players, and that's something that that's just not something I was able to do in the past. So you kids who are playing online, and you're like, oh, I kicked this guy and this guy, and I've been through seven players this way. No, it was not like that. So when you hear stories about uh, people who put up with problem players, just be advised. 
part of that is muscle memory. Part of that is when I counted myself lucky that I found three people who were interested in playing a game with me. And it's, uh, so yeah. Anyway, going off on a rant, today is a good day to be running a game because not only is there an abundance of campaigns and uh, an abundance of games that you can get into with a wash of systems to fit whatever tone you want. There, You can do that as a player and then as a referee once you've hit that sweet spot. Once you have something that you're enjoying that you want to run with, you can survive. You can recruit and you can be picky about the players. So if the player doesn't fit, you can replace them. If the player moves on of their own accord, then you can find another person. And that's a beautiful, wonderful thing. And I'm excited because that means that the hobby is flourishing now. Like I was not aware or that when I was a kid that it couldn't. Uh, just because where I lived, not not a big crowd. But anyway, thanks for the call. Hey Taylor, it is Hobbs calling into the Whispering GM. In a quarter mile, continue straight to stay on South Main Street. Hey man, I don't I don't know how much I like uh, your buddy Hobbs being uh, called out in an episode called Adversarial Play. Yeah adversarial play you were the ref remember it couldn't have been targeted but that story with the uh fire rune on the scroll case is Continue is straight pretty to stay on south main street is pretty epic and i think it's pretty indicative of a regular session of calmada as far as it being adversarial I don't think so, but maybe we should Continue take a poll. On South Main Street for one and a half miles. I apologize for the GPS going in the background, but it just seems apropos for a call in from the screeter himself. Keep it going, brother. Later. I agree with you there. I think that's a fun story to tell, and I do not consider it an adversarial move. Uh, to evidence this, I will point folks back to my player skill episode, because this is the second time I've told that story, the first time being in the context of player skill, and namely how I didn't have any. <laughs> but that's a good idea. What do the gang think? What do you, the listener, think? Would putting a trap on an item inside a cache, as opposed to putting it on the container of the cache, be adversarial or would that just be a good way to keep players on their toes i will try to set up a poll uh, on social media i will try to listen out for call-ins i would appreciate the call-ins what do you guys think and uh in the meantime thank you jason for calling in as opposed to calling out <laughs> hey jason here just talking to you about play versus prep and good episode. I think this is a great, and I agree with you 100%. Get out and play. You know, don't try to get everything perfect. Don't worry about getting it all done. I'm 100% with you on this. But I will say this is definitely something that's changed. And this is where we can show the OSR is not the way they played back in the day. This is a great example of the differences between the OSR and the way Guy Gax and crew looked at the, the game should be played. This is a change. This is where this is revisionism here. Because in the old days, look at the Guy Gax 75 challenge. That's what he expected you to do, that level world building. You know, when you look in OD and D, he says the dungeon should look something uh, the, sorry. Unquestionably this will require a great deal of time and effort and imagination. You know, he wants you to have three fully stocked levels of a dungeon before you even let players near it, right? If we look at Mulvey's basic set. You know, we see that in there he talks about, you know, if I can find it, but basically he, he says the same thing, that it's going to require a lot of effort and the DM's got to make the whole dungeon and map it out and all that stuff before you even start. Uh, here it is. Um, do, do, the DM should have the dungeon carefully mapped out before play begins. He talks about figuring out every little thing. So, and like I say, Gygax 75's challenge is the perfect way, place to see this. 
they expected you to do all this stuff ahead of time. That's changed with the OSR, and that's a good change because I agree with you 100%. But we, we need to recognize this is where the OSR has evolved from the way it was played in the 70s, and the, or at least the way it was envisioned by the creators in the 70s. So great episode, great advice. You know, do it Taylor's way, not, got, not Gary's way. Thank you kindly. It's good to know that we're doing something right. Thinking about it, I wonder how much of this is spare time related. And that's, uh, I wasn't around in the 70s, but when I was a kid, uh, and to be clear, I'm not trying to say that I'm contradicting myself. I still firmly believe that prep is the enemy of play, as Jason was agreeing with. Uh, but I'm wondering, when I was a kid, video games existed, but they were expensive and we didn't, we didn't have them. Um, computers existed, but we didn't get one until we moved to the big house and my, my dad picked one up to do the QuickBooks on it or Quicken or something, whatever, whatever the company that did the spreadsheets for, for home business was in 1989. But yeah, when I was a kid, there were, yeah, there was television, but there wasn't really, I remember we didn't have rabbit ears at the house, but my grandma certainly did. Uh, we had we had basic cable. At one point, we got an expanded cable, but then certain channels got blocked out. And you, you, there wasn't a lot on during the day. During and during prime time, there were a couple shows that you would want to see, but that was like six to seven, and you're done. And so that was maybe an hour, an hour and a half of your day. So. I, like I said, I was not around in the 70s, but I can only assume the same was true even to a greater extent because you're talking about there are no video games. They flat out don't exist. There are no computers. You flat out don't have a home version. Uh, the rabbit ears are universal. I don't I don't know when cable became a thing, but it cert, like I said, it certainly wasn't at my grandmother's. And so having that, having that time, what do you do with it? Um, Arguably, that's one of the reasons that nowadays we're fatter <laughs> than we were. Because what are you going to do? You go like you go outside. Like when I was when I was young, I used to go play in the woods. And my boys, I'm very very grateful that they are the kind to go out and play in the woods and then wrestle with neighbor kids in uh, in their yard instead of hanging out. And then of course my wife goes and gives them uh, toddler tablets for their birthday. But and we'll see we'll see where that goes. But yeah, genuinely curious. I'm, uh, did people spend more time in prep for campaigns in the early days because, one, you have restricted communication and you can only play so much, but two, because there wasn't a lot competing for that attention? Honest question. Very curious. Jay Murphy from the Vanishing Tower, Vanishing Tower Press, all things Vanishing Tower. I recognized your voice right off the rip, and I wonder, did that tower vanish because of some eldritch sorcery, or did it vanish because somebody lost the map? I wanted to comment on the mapping. I think it's absurd to consider it a physical object that players can lose in-game. Mapping is, um, especially with Dungeons & Dragons, is a, a convenience a necessary tool to facilitate conversation and communication between players and game master. Treating it as an actual in-game artifact where someone's sitting there and scribbling away and like, hold on, don't shoot that fireball because I might lose my map is absurd. It's a convenience of communication within a role-playing game. It is not a physical item. When was the last time you've been in a confusing place and you actually sat down and tried to map it so you knew where you were going and how to get back out? The answer is never. Fun fact. We took my family to the aquarium, the Florida aquarium, over the weekend for my wife's birthday. And my older twin told me he was drawing the map. Uh, he had his magnetic drawing pad. You know, the, I don't know what they're actually called, but they've got that uh, little magnet 
stylus that you can draw with and there's a little slider at the bottom that erases it for you in a big swipe he had drawn a couple different blotches and as we were driving along he would arbitrarily determine we had reached one of his blotches and would continue a little point crawl through his little uh, toddler map so when was the last time that i tried to figure out where i was with the map well never but my four-year-old he he did it this week regarding the treatment of the map as a point of communication I think I kind of agree with that. That's that's where my brain was going when I did not confiscate the map. Because, like I mentioned in the episode, I did not want to discourage the behavior. Uh, plus, the player had written other notes on the map that would not have been things that were mapping related. So stuff like NPC names or some of the equipment that he found or XP. And you're not gonna you're not gonna store XP on your map like. If I, if I pull up Google Maps, it may have a transcript of places I've been, but it's not gonna, I'm not gonna level up uh, by going through it. So thinking of it as a communication mechanism, I think that's a good way to think about it. Though it does make me wonder about other conversations I've had about players selling their maps. To, uh, either two other players, as was I think I think uh, we talked about this on the episode where Rick Stump was on Cleric's Square Ringmail. I need to call him and get him back on. I haven't. I'll find a call in where we can chat up about something. But and then there's the alternative uh, game that Bandits Keep. Daniel over at Bandits Keep has been playing on his solo play, where they use the outdoor survival rules for mappers to find locations and troves and then the party will go out and look for the treasure but thinking about it too the slight miscommunications between player and gm make more sense if you're selling a map that varying degree of accuracy that you've got because if um if you're in a place drawing it's a little easier to make a representation than if you know you have that kind of back and forth. And that difference, that change between the accuracy of the map uh, that you per, that you sell or purchase, that may represent the um, imperfect memory of the character who had scrawled it down. Fun, fun things to think about. Thanks for calling in. Hey, Taylor, Jason here. Just listened to your latest episode, Tips on Mapping and Other Calls. Jay Shields called in asking about campaigns versus one-shots. I've always said my ideal group, and whether it's one group or two groups, but my ideal role-playing situation is to have a weekly ongoing campaign, you know, with the same group, and then also have maybe a different day of the week or every other week with a different group or that same group, but a different day, have a rotating game where maybe we rotated the game we played every month or every three months, that kind of thing. So we get a lot of one shots, get a lot of different systems played. Currently, I kind of very lucky that I have that situation. I've got a couple long going campaigns that I've participated in. Plus, I have a group that we rotate GMs. So we rotate games that we play in. So that's my ideal solution is get both. I agree. <clears throat> That would be the ideal place to be. That's a place I was briefly uh, a while back. What was it? That was right at the beginning of the pandemic, right before it kind of shut down. I think we had um, on. I had a Tuesday game where I was playing an axe. I had a Thursday game I was playing in with some, uh, doing the the law before before the one with the the Sam Temple and all that stuff. And then there was the road that I was playing in Kalmata a lot at the time too. So that was the place to be. I got to play a couple different games, a couple different people, and was really enjoying it. And I remember mentioning to my wife that uh, I was proud of myself for alternating nights. So usually we would play like Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, or Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And so I would sleep a little bit in between. And uh, she didn't take it the right way. <laughs> She, um, uh, and I'm sorry about my voice, this and the call-in from Jay 
Um, I've got a little bit of a sore throat, so if I sound weird, I'm going to blame it on that. But, uh, so yeah, my wife was like, oh, wow, yeah, three times, that's way too much. And I was like, but I'm happy, and you're unconscious when I'm doing it. Uh, on the inside. So I'm, I've made up for it. I've made up for it now. So hopefully I'll be back to uh, one or two, uh, one or two weeks per game, or two or three games a month. Well, well I'll get there. So hopefully I'm gonna pick back up the O D and D after Easter, and we will uh, we will see where it leads us. Oh, and before I forget, the heyday of my role play when I was doing uh, a Thursday night league and then a home game, which was usually Saturday. Um, that was twice a week. <coughs> I remember buddies in the same role play group. I was like, yeah, we should do another one. Can we do an, you can run your game this day. And they're like, but we want to play Warcraft, but we want to see movies or do board games. Like, oh no, that's not how this, that's not how this hobby works. Casuals. Love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think at least one of you, uh, I think at least one of my old college group still listens. And just one other note, thank you for answering my question about mapping and GM tips. I think that's really cool. I really do like the idea of describing a room or describing an area depending on that character's nature, right? So like you say, elves, you can describe the exits, the hobbits, you can describe the contents, th those kind of things. But you, I think that would probably conflict with the problem of that building a rapport with a mapper because your mapper is expecting you to give the information in the same order each time. They're, so I think that could kind of make that harder on the mapper. And ultimately, if any one player is mapping, I, I think you would probably want to default to that mapper as opposed to describing it per character in the order of things they would see. That said, I agree with you. I think it's fascinating. I also think it will be a lot of work on the GM because you're you're having to write notes on there, and, and so you would end up needing a something in front of you with each character, maybe to well, you wouldn't need this, but I I would need it <laughs> to jog my memory. Oh yeah, this this time I'm going to describe the you know when when Joe Bob asks, I'm going to describe the doors first, but when Tweedledee asks, I'm going to describe the contents and food sources first. So I, I think it just matters on on what you're going for, but ultimately I think that consistency for the mapper. Would, would probably win out, but that is a fascinating method. Thank you so much, and I look forward to your next episode. I think the idea that you kind of popped onto in the middle there is what I was thinking when I was going to go for it. Now, keep in mind, I have, I think I mentioned this in the episode, but if not, I will clarify. I have never actually pulled this off. It was just, it was something someone else was doing that I thought was the coolest thing ever that I want to do so bad. But, um, <coughs> excuse me. But uh, anyway, the um, my thought was that you would go with whatever the mapper is. So the mapper may not be point man, but the mapper will be... So if the mapper was playing an elf, you would describe it like an elf. If the mapper was playing uh, a dwarf, you would describe it like a dwarf, and, and so on. And so I think that's the smart thing to do, and I agree. It... One, that would fall if you changed it up every time that would definitely totally fly in the face of the build a rapport advice that i was trying to give <laughs> in in that episode great uh i'm i'm glad that uh that stuck out for you i'm, I'm i got some positive feedback feedback from a couple places on that episode Thank you, everybody, for listening. I'm glad it stuck with you. And uh, if you've tried out any of these techniques, call in. Let me know. I would love to hear about uh, about how these work, how other techniques work uh, that I haven't heard of before, or some novel stuff that you're wanting to try out and see if you can uh, harass some of my listeners into giving a playtest for you. Anyway, would love to hear back. And uh, in any case, Jason, thank you for calling in. Hey, Taylor, I really enjoyed your um, podcast on adversarial play. As you probably know, I had a probably long-ish, um, maybe too long podcast on PvP and RPGs, and I thank you for some of the reasons you gave for not having adversarial play in a very logical manner, and it could help uh, to serve as some rebuttal for some questions I've gotten about it or or whatever. Thanks for mentioning that uh, Wosome Tale of Pendragon. I think uh, Jess Shields mentioned it. Um, again, it's a tale of two brothers 
who are rivals in real life and brought that into the game, which is kind of interesting in a different, maybe psychological manner. But uh, good stuff. Uh, it's too bad we don't get to play as often together. I really enjoyed you playing uh, as part of a team uh, way back in Kalmada. Hey there, Carl. Thank you for calling in and thank you for being on the air. Talking about your PvP episode, I was aware of the PvP episode because I had specifically listened to it. Now, I I say that I've been very not list, bad about listening to podcasts lately. I've been um, kind of a dark place for a couple months, but I'm coming out of it. It's getting a lot brighter, and I'm starting to listen to people again. And I went, when you mentioned it, I went to your back catalog and checked. I'm like, yep, that's showing as, as red. But then there was a follow-up. As of this recording, Carl has two episodes talking about PvP. The first has a couple PvP instances as well as some recaps, and the second is a call-in episode where a couple callers talk about recaps. Regarding, I listened to that one. I listened to the call-in episode this morning while I was on the elliptical just to be make sure I was in the know to respond to this epi, uh, this message, and. I got, uh, I got, I was very interested in what uh, Amy had to say, talking about her experience with PvP and uh, World of Warcraft, and that is, uh, it took me back. Uh, I, there were two big zones I remember: the Crossroads and uh, was was a, it wasn't South Shore. It was, it was a Green Alliance area where you could summon Hercular, and he would mess up a local. Uh, <laughs> He was like a level 40 elite. He would mess up a local town. It was always fun to complete that quest. But the moral of the story is those zones, I played in the, the normal region where you could flag for PvP, but you didn't have to. But then invariably there would be somebody tempting you, like a level 5, running around where he shouldn't be flagged for PvP. But as soon as you attacked him, his level 60 guildmates would come out and start pounding on you and take... And so it was a trap. And... um. So uh, where was I going with that? That tied in that, that that bullying. So I'd come out with my level fifteen, which is level appropriate for say crossroads, and then the and this is old World of Warcraft. This is vanilla. <laughs> so if someone out there is just fuming, that is not what crossroads. Are. No, it's it's because I was playing this like ten years ago, uh, longer than that, because I quit playing after I got married. But anyway, so this is this is when Warcraft was new, and that trap, that trying to get you in and then getting ganked when you're level appropriate and your adver adversaries are not, that I think is what she's talking about, and that ties in to what Joe mentioned near in a call-in. Now the story Joe was talking about, uh, players who wanted to get into the module that was being run at a con, and the other, the the one player casting a spell that caused them to party wipe. That is, I agree, that's kind of lame. But it highlights what is the difference between PvP and game versus uh, adversarial play. Can they coexist? And the reason I got to thinking about it is some, some adversarial play that is defined as player on player is not adversarial in the sense that it's ill intent. So, well, the, you think about it, if everybody at the table likes PvP, and in World of Warcraft, they used to have PvP servers where everybody was automatically flagged for PvP at all times. So there are people out there who enjoy the PvP aspect. And if you're at a table where everybody enjoys PvP, bring it on. Uh, that's the kind of that's the kind of game they want to play and everybody's into it, then it becomes competitive. And the uh, by contrast, if you have people who don't want to be competitive, you don't want to PvP, then having that's going to ruin it. So it's almost as though you need a unanimous vote. You need everybody at the table to want to PvP in order for PvP to work at an, at an RPG table. And so that that may be its own episode. I'm going to add that to my back catalog of things I want to talk about. What is the difference between uh, an adversarial game and a competitive game? Um, <clears throat> but we're neither here nor there. I appreciate the uh, call-in, and I appreciate the sentiment. Uh, I miss playing with the Audio Dungeon crew. Uh, I miss playing in general. Like I mentioned, I was kind of in a dark place, and I wasn't playing for a while, and it's... um 
turning around, we're brightening up, and uh, as I like to continue the metaphor, I always say that uh, we play the hand we're dealt, and these days it's looking like the card coming down the river may mean I won't have to fold. Hey Taylor, super strong way to come to, to the close of OSR October, pick your players. Yeah, expectations are huge. And I think you nailed it. I, I think that's really important. And I think the other thing is, and you touched on this, don't be angry at your friends if they're not interested in a campaign you're running. You know, maybe you'll play a different game together. That's fine. But if you are if you say, hey, guys, we're about to do a domain play game, and one of the players is like, hey, that's not really my thing, don't get angry at them and butthurt at them. Say, okay, that's cool. We'll catch your next campaign. You know, everybody has different likes, and that's okay. Don't get angry when one of your players decides that they're not interested in a specific campaign. And, and the same thing as a player. If you're not interested in, in a game, be honest with the GM. Don't sign up and then ghost them. So, Taylor, thank you for that great episode. Thank you for a great OSR October. And I look forward to your calling episode. Take care. And here that calling episode is. Only like a million years late. <laughs> I'm recording the episode now on my drive home. I've been working on it for a couple commutes now. I may break it up and release them incrementally just, you know, to keep it at the 30 minute mark, but we'll see. We'll see where we go. And it's awesome to hear you call in and hopefully I'll be able to play again next year. I really enjoyed the format that Rob took for Octo SR. He had an idea for every day and then said something every day and it was kind of short and sweet. And yeah, I, uh, I may be able to do that. I may be able to skip the show notes again. And, well, we'll see. We'll see when we get there. Because if I can uh, if I can go gorilla, just kind of timestamp it and run, then we'll be gold. And, all right. Anyway, peace out, my man. Seven. Seven whole episodes. As you might have noticed, I did in fact break up the Octo SR call-ins and sprinkled some new ones in there too. But between those calls and the new, y'all gave me seven full episodes, three and a half, four hours of content to put up on the air. So I want to take a quick moment at the end of this episode. We've officially gotten through all of the Octo SR calls and I wanted to say thank you. Thank you first to my callers who you guys keep me going. The fact that you're listening, the fact that you're thinking about it, the fact that you're calling in, it's more than just making my job easy, getting this stuff on the air. It's it's about the camaraderie. It feels like a community. This podcast isn't me shouting into the void. It's me having a conversation with friends. And I want to say thank you also to all of those listeners out there. Listeners who engage me on social media, listeners who uh, write in, listeners who listen and then don't really say anything. I appreciate every one of you. The fact that you're listening is the reason that I keep doing this episode after episode. And I wanted to give you a special thank you right now. So, that in mind, uh, be on the lookout for some more original content, for some more new stuff coming forward, and here's to hope I can keep it moving. I do not promise to be regular, but I do promise to stay on the air. Delve on.